I'm honored to be here, and I'm even more honored that so many people showed up uh, for this little talk about an open source project. I realize it's a little bit of a pretentious title, because it's mostly what I learned from this open source project, but I hope that you benefit a little bit from that as well. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is essentially everything we are practicing in our open source project. I'm saying we, because it's me and my partner in crime, Jonas Nier, who's sitting here in the front, who has been helping me for the last four years. Uh, so this is not necessarily about how great Fluent Assertion is, because nobody cares about that, but more like, what are we using from, what, are we, what am I using there, which practices, which tools, and especially how I'm using them uh, at my day job, because I'm a consultant. This is my name, Dennis Duman. I'm from the Netherlands, which you can obviously hear from my accent. Um, I want to actually uh, give some kudos to um, at least one person who's in the group, who is in this audience. Uh, I think 20 years ago or something like that, I started reading Jimmy Nielsen's book about um, domain-driven design with uh, test-driven development in .NET. Uh, that was the starting point. The other one is Jeremy Miller. I think he's sitting there in the corner. And you probably see him yesterday. He wrote a couple of blog posts a long time ago. Jeremy's, I don't know, first, second, fourth thought about TDD. And that's what started this whole little project. Anyway, so who am I? Um, I'm in the .NET space for a little bit more than 26 years. I'm turning 50 uh, in September. Um, I help my clients, you know, do things better. And of course, using Fluent Assertions in my libraries. But I'm also looking at architecture and tools and people and all of that, which is part of the job. So in a, in a way, my open source project is a little bit of a playground. You know, I try new tools, new techniques, see if it works. And then I'll start bugging my clients with that. Um, I have a blog. Who cares? I have uh, coding guidelines for the last 20 years. Uh, I have a couple of open source projects. And of course, the one that, uh, that I'm going to a little bit be talking about, which is the, the subject of this talk, Fluent Assertions. Um, it's not 250 million. I think it's 244 million something, plus one, because somebody just downloaded it, as he said, which is uh, good enough. But it sounds like it's going really fast for some reason. Um, by the way, you can win a one-year license for JetBrains li uh, Rider. I'm a big fan of JetBrains. Uh, by creating a picture of one of the slides, saying something nice or something nasty, that's also perfectly fine. Um, maybe that you're just waiting for the next two talks to be finished so you can go to the party, like I am. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Mastodon, and even Blue Sky, uh, which is confusing because now I have three applications to monitor for messages. So what is the project? Um, it's something like this. You can do like assertions, like yeah, it's fluent. It's a fluent API in C Sharp. Uh, to make your test a little bit more readable. So you can do st stuff like shoot contain. You can do something like shoot throw invalid operation if you care about that. Um, uh, other examples, uh, like you can do some, some kind of reflection uh, checks to make sure that everything, uh, all your code complies to certain structures. Um, and the most powerful feature is that you can actually compare two object graphs and it will give you very nice messages, which is what the library is about. Is it successful? Yeah, I mean, my wife, my wife is actually asking me, like, why didn't you earn any money from it? Like, I mean, if it's only one cent, you know, you wouldn't have to go away to conferences and everything. So, yeah, but I love that. I love speaking about my thing. Is it successful? I don't know. I mean, yeah, the downloads is impressive, but everybody knows that we're running build agents and they're just downloading all the packages all over again. In fact, it's running day and night. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for me, one of the, the, the special steps was that it started to be used within the .NET framework. Uh, it started with the SDK, and now it's used everywhere, which is pretty awesome. And Microsoft is also uh, doing some interesting stuff with that. Uh, number of stars, mm, moi, okay. So why do I think it's, um, it's, it's so successful? Honestly, I have no clue. I have some ideas, though, because I like building packages. It's a library, not a framework. It means you use it, and if you don't like it, you drop it. Whereas a framework is something that will, you know, you, you get completely entangled in it, not something you can drop. If you start using Identity Server from Duende, yeah, you're screwed. You have to pay for that, although that's a really good library. Uh, it has very clean code, which is debatable because it's very subjective, but I have some strong opinions about clean code. It's designed using test-driven development. It is. So the tests of the project are supposed to be documentation. Um, it, it's used in test code, which means there's no risk for anybody to use it. It doesn't actually affect production code. It works with a lot of testing frameworks. It is supposedly, what people are saying, 
improves readability. It has a very clear release strategy, which we'll talk about. It's designed for extensibility, which by, this, by itself is a complicated thing. Anybody has built a serious production product and wants to make it extensible, I guess almost anybody done that actually, making the extensibility is interface on that project, so to make it easy to you know, not have to change the code base, the monolithical code base, and allow you to extend it. Uh, usually it's pretty hard, I think. It always backfires for some reason. Great documentation, great support from me and Jonas. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 the, it, it, the community is growing. That's really nice to see that. It has very nice messages. It tells you exactly what's wrong with you, uh, what's wrong with the code, sorry. Um, and has a pretty catchy name. I think that's a bit um, subjective, I would say. Um, there's other libraries which we'll not talk about because they're not relevant. So. If somebody starts to use the library, the first thing, and I'm going a little bit through the whole workflow, try to use that, I can actually see you. Um, you start with creating an issue. So the first step is you need to go to you know, the repository, figure out where's the code. Of course, there's a beautiful website and it brings you to the, to the, the, the right location. This is a screenshot of the organization structure. There's actually a Fluent Assertion organization, but the only two libraries that me and Jonas maintain is Fluent Assertion and the JSON one. The rest are contributions or people that want to be part of this, you could almost say ecosystem, but it's, yeah, okay, yeah. But there's multiple libraries. There's actually quite a lot uh, of extensions to that. Um, then you create an issue. I love this, by the way. Uh, anybody using GitHub? Yeah, of course you are. Anybody using Azure DevOps? All these proud people. Um, what's really cool is, uh, GitHub is extremely customizable. So one of the things we're doing is create issue templates. So if you create an issue, it's not just an empty screen that you fill in. You, can, you actually get this. And I'm pretty sure in the back it's not really readable. But uh, it says, like, I, I want to create a bug report. I want to do an API suggestion. It's a general purpose feature. Uh, I just want to go to the documentation. I want to sponsor Fluent Assertions because, yeah, uh, we are vesting all this time. We're not getting anything back except the talk at the NDC. Um, you can ask questions on Stack Overflow. This stuff is something you can create. And there's a nice example how you can do that. You can also find that in the repository. So just assume the repository is kind of a, a source of all this information. Um, this is quite nice, actually, because the biggest concern with, and I, I think you will have that even within your own projects, people putting an issue report in JIRA, it's never complete. You know, you get this half-baked uh, request, something that doesn't work. Well, you get that also with your open source project. So we try to streamline pro that process a little bit by making sure you, re you provide the required uh, information for that. This is a nice way to do that. Um, what else? So since we get so many requests and we get kind of, you know, frustrated by it, we want to actually have people propose an API. Because, yeah, it's a library, and as I said, like 250 million downloads means that we have a certain responsibility to the community to be consistent, to really think about the API. It's not just a stupid little library. Well, it's still a stupid little library, but, you know, a lot of people are depending on that. So we introduced some kind of mini workflow in GitHub using labels, like API proof, the API needs work, API ready for review. And we started doing that when people started to, I don't know, submit a pull request with an entirely big niche feature that they worked on for months. And then we have to say, like, yeah, I'm sorry, I love, I love what you did, but it's not really our thing. So we tried to streamline it. And now what we do is somebody creates an issue, we put a label on it, like it's an API suggestion, and then me and Jonas start to chat on it on Slack, talk about it, maybe even talk about it uh, more publicly because it's usually an issue. And only if it's approved, somebody is allowed to create a pull request. Again, that sounds very strict, but it's just like a real project. You know, you need to take responsibility for that code. You're maintaining it for other people. In fact, you would say, because it's an open source project, it's e you even have more responsibility than, you know, with these uh, 50 different developers that you work with. We have probably thousands of developers that depend on that. So that's one thing we do. Um, design challenges, yeah, plenty of them. I mean, I said we have extensibility things. Uh, like the first question is, do we want this to be in the library? Or is this something that somebody should build using our extensibility service? And if that's not possible, can we propose that? Like one of the biggest, I think, um, regrets I have, and I'm pretty sure Jonas agrees, is that we accepted data set support in Fluent Assertions. Uh, .NET developers remembering data set? It's something from the past, right? 
and now it's back in it, and now we have to maintain it, and that was a mistake. Uh, so this is something we have to think about. We also have to think about breaking changes, obviously. We don't want to cause that, and they can be very nasty. Like everything looks fine on the, on the C-sharp level, but then we have some kind of binary compatibility level. Because there's a lot of extension libraries that directly depend on fluent assertions, and if we break something accidentally, that's a problem. Um, consistency, like should all satisfy, throw an exception if the collection is empty? Or should it actually not throw an exception if the collection is empty? Well, that is the question. And it's not really consistent sometimes, and we can have uh, like religious debates about that. Um, which some people can be very, by the way, very aggressive if we say we don't want to do that because, you know, it confuses people. Like a real project, yeah? Records, tuples, uh, how do you deal with that if you compare to tuples? Do you want to use the implicit, implicit equals implementation? Do you want to compare the properties and the fields of that? Yeah, these are difficult decisions in our little, you know, bubble that we live in. And async, async postfix. Any .NET developers doing async here? Couple, yeah. You all put all your all postfix, all your methods with async, right? Or not? Or uh, yeah, sometimes. Or you want to fight about it? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. So we have the same thing. Same thing. So if you figure it out, you created the issue and you propose something. And uh, we accepted that, you know, we thought about it, we had a good uh, constructive discussion. You start to look at the repository in more detail. So the next thing is you start to read the README, because the README is something you read. Um, a good README, and by the way, this completely applies to all my internal projects, the client projects I work on, should explain what is it supposed to do, where do I find the artifacts, does it publish NPM or NuCat packages, where are they? Uh, where to report an issue, how to build the whole thing, what, is your, what are the prerequisites, what do you need, which Visual Studio or .NET SDK or NPM version or Yarn or Fight or whatever you need, needs to be documented there, because that's what you need. You know, there's this little rule, like a uh, rule guideline that I don't know exactly who said that, but if I cannot come into your organization and get your, your repository cloned, built and run in five minutes, something is wrong. It's a bit exaggerated. Uh, because I don't think even this one can run in five minutes, but it's a, it's a good heuristic. You know, it makes you think, like, how complicated is it? I mean, how many reports have you seen? There's no documentation whatsoever. And like, how do I build this thing? Yeah, you go in this folder, then you open that file. Oh, that's kind of the thing here. Um, then you look at the contribution guidelines. Wow, that's almost like a legal document. Like, you need to sign in blood that when you contribute something. Um, it has grown over the time. But just like all documentation and guidelines you write within your organization, they kind of organically grow because you know people make mistakes, you want to improve that. So it's the same here. We have good contribution guidelines that should help you find existing issues. Uh, the first thing, if you find an issue. Um, release notes and documentation, yeah, we have them. They're generated, we have two sets of release notes. Um, we have release notes generated by GitHub, which I'll show you later on, which is pretty neat. But we also have more functional release notes, which are basically markdown files we maintain. Um, we also have like functional documentation. That's all markdown. I'll show you later on how we, uh, how we build that. And uh, yeah, well, actually, you can see that this is the markdown script. Um, so in terms of everything is CLI, is Git. So what tools do I use? That's a good question, because it can be a pretty religious debate whether you want to use CLI commands for Git or a UI. Actually, I use a lot of different tools. I use um, PowerShell, obviously, Windows Terminal. I use, um, what else? PowerShell, I mentioned those already. Um, I use oh my Posh, which probably a lot of developers that love terminal things know because you get nice colors. I like colors. Looks very professional, you know? No, no. Uh, I use PS Readline because PowerShell is a bit uh, limited. Uh, I want to be able to go back in my history. You know, that kind of stuff, because I type a lot of stuff there. Um, and I actually, and this is one of my, uh, my most, um, which, which I really love and changed the way, is um, Phil Hack. You probably remember him from NuGet. He now works for GitFlow. Uh, no, I don't actually know he works for GitHub anymore. But he wrote a couple of aliases in Git that makes it very easy to push your local changes. Like, I can make some local changes, then I do git save, which just takes whatever is on my working directory, creates a temporary commit, then I do git push, and when I'm done, like the next day, I want to continue, I just do git undo, which basically unrolls that temporary commit, 
And I do that all day long. So I keep amending my changes. I don't even care about the commit messages because at the end, I'm going to clean up my commits because I love clean source control history. And there's a wealth of awesome little uh, Git aliases that you can get from that. If you can't find you can always uh, ping me afterwards. Um, and next to that, I use Z location, which is a nice add-in, which allows me to quickly, quickly jump to location. I can probably even demonstrate that because I have a PowerShell. Like, uh, let me open a PowerShell. You see all those nice colors? I wasn't supposed to do live demos, but you know what? It's just NDC, so what can go wrong? So PowerShell, and you see, and now I can say I want to go to Fluent, and it jumps right at, at the location. If I want to go to different location, it just remembers where you are, so it's like a powerful CD, which I use a lot, because I use a lot of CLR commands. But not only, because I'm also like, I like GUIs as well. I mean, yeah, you, sh you should use best of both worlds, right? Some tools are better, like CLIs are better for quickly pushing my changes. But I use Git, so, hello, Git Kraken, which I love working with because I also like to clean up my commits. You know, I unroll, I start to uh, do interactive rebases, I undo things because I like clean history. So it's perfectly fine to have both. Um, some technical patterns, uh, editor config. Uh, I use that a lot. We use it a lot for structuring the code base, making sure that you know everything aligns properly. That we use uh, two spaces instead of tabs. No, it's four spaces, or is it eight spaces? What is it again? Um, no, it's four. Of course, it's four spaces, right? No. Oh, uh, any tabs? No, no, no. Sorry, not, not going to do that. <laughs> we'll do that uh, after after we had the first couple of beers. We can fight about that. Anyway. Um, doesn't matter as long as you do it the way I want to do it, which is for spaces. But the editor config is very nice because, of course, it works with Visual Studio and all the other tools, Rider. But you can also extend it heavily, like a lot of extensions that I'll talk about uh, can be used there as well. Uh, by the way, it's interesting. I'm a big proponent of Rider. Uh, for some reason, and I have not been able to explain that, Jonas actually prefers Visual Studio. Um, so, in a way, that's a good thing. It me basically means that the code base can work for both people. Okay, what else? Uh, yeah, analyzers. We love analyzers. Because, as you probably all know, developers make mistakes. I make mistakes. Jonas continuously corrects me because I'm lazy. You know, I'm at the conferences and trying to make some changes. There's some beautiful analyzers that you can for free. The Roslyn analyzers that are part of the .NET framework. Then you have Roslynator, and this is the one that I never uh, managed to ex uh, uh, like pronounce. Museum 2analyzer um, those are very useful because that make your code easier. Like it will, for example, make sure that your XML comments are, are, are properly co uh, formatted. Not like, I'm not talking about inline comments, but like proper documentation, that it looks correctly, that all the references in the XML if the co the comments are correct. Because yeah, people rely on that. If you're building a library, and I'm building a lot of libraries internal in my project as well, you know, to create decouple and everything, this is a nice feature. Uh, but also stupid things like using link incorrectly. I think I saw a chat somewhere from Jeremy and some other people. Oh, actually, it was um, Daniel talked about performance of linked. Um, the analyzer would actually detect that and help you use more optimized versions of link or even use extensions or static methods that are much faster than this link statement. Uh, nested conditional statements. You know, the, the, the question mark, and then you have a semicolon, you know, to choose between two options. So there's apparently people uh, in this world that love to nest them. So you like, uh, I see some people wondering like, oh crap. <laughs> and uh, there's, even, there's even like criminals that want to go three levels deep. <laughs> okay, not in my world or not in our code base. Um, long methods, define long, yeah, we can have a discussion about that. I have an opinion about that. Uh, it's not seven methods, by the way, seven statements. That's a bit too much. But can, by the way, you can also do this with Sonar Cube and all the other tools, but uh, this is nicer because you get immediate feedback. And simple things like simple type by file, uh, and, you, and throwing the correct exception types. That actually was interesting. We found some mistakes uh, from people in the past, me. Um, and proper async support, that's also nice, to actually use it correctly. Like, you know, have a method that returns a task, and then you're not awaiting it. I mean, that, that is wrong, right? And this is something that a wrestling analyzer can help. Um, naming and grouping of tests, that's another thing. So I don't know if it's visible all the way in the back, 
But we have uh, this class, it's called reference types assertion specs. So I'm a TDD addict and I call things specs to emphasize that these are specifications. And then we have these very long names, like when the same objects are expected to be the same, it should not feel, fail. That's quite long. And I was a big proponent of this for a long, long time. Um, I actually started to change that. Now we're grouping things. We're grouping things by, for example, the fact that this API was, if you go back, is about should be same as. So we basically create a nested class to name or to group all the tests that belong together because we have a lot. I don't remember exactly how many, there are like 25,000 or something? 25,000 unit tests we have, which is cheating because we have six .NET frameworks, but it's still a lot, still a lot. So now it can be a little bit shorter, like when two variables are referring to the same object, it should not fail. Well, we already know that the context of this is be same as. So we made it shorter. We've been looking at all kinds of variants, like should succeed, but then somebody said like, but when and should, there's just noise, it's just ceremony. So these days we stick to very short names. Reference to the same object are valid. Reference to different objects are invalid, which is like pretty concise, but it's still functional correct. And it doesn't describe a, a desire, it describes more like a fact. And it's totally fine if you do something else, but I, I, I kind of feel like this is, we found a nice optimized way to represent test names. Um, what else, documenting exceptions, yeah, who does that? By the way, in Java, that's required. Um, we're doing it now. I still have some doubts whether we should have done that, but this is typically a design uh, discussion you have like online with people, like, is this useful? Yeah, but it's useful to know which exceptions you're throwing. So now we're doing it. We're using the, um, the exception uh, here, exception, C ref, argument zero, uh, and then it provides you information. A nice thing is if you then use your pop-up, your IntelliSense, you get all the information here, which is useful. Um, directory build.props, which is a .NET specific thing, is a nice way to make sure that all the projects in your folder have the same imports, which we use a lot. I don't know if you know about that, but it's something reasonably new. It uh, makes it a lot easier. Faking time, which doesn't exist. Yeah, we have a lot of methods, and uh, I use the same um, concept also in my client's projects, is that you sometimes have to deal with time, with clocks and, and delays and stuff like that. And you can find the examples in the code itself, but we created a little abstraction. Sometimes, by the way, I use delegates for this. Uh, to say that we want to be able to delay the time, and then we have a dummy implementation in our tests. I think uh, there's an example here that you can look at. This makes it easier to, yeah, so that you don't have to put sleeps in code, in test code, because I've seen that, sleeps in test code. You shouldn't do that, right? No, you shouldn't do that, no. What else? Um, BDD style testing, yeah, so as you saw maybe before, we use a lot of these arrange act assert, and I use that everywhere, which is, pretty well suited for most of the test cases. You know, you have the range where you set up the, 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 the setup code, your initial state of whatever you're testing. Then you have the act is basically to emphasize what you're doing, eh? you're invoking something on the subject on the test. And then the, the assert obviously is to verify the outcome. Uh, sometimes you're dealing with classes or uh, subjects in a test that are more orchestrational. In those cases, I'm actually switching to more like a BDD style type. So what you see here is like uh, a given and then a when here, some when, and then the basically the fact. This is using chill, that's another library I'm maintaining. I didn't create it myself, by the way. Um, which worked quite nice because it automatically disposes everything that needs to be disposes at the end. Um, and makes the code a little bit more readable. I can imagine if you see that, it's like that's a lot of text, of course it is. But if you look at more the concrete examples, it's very nice. This is the class on the top of it. Given temporary global assertion options is derived from given when then, and the dispose will clean up something. Um, if you have more complicated scenarios, you usually create all kinds of objects that you have to dispose at the end, they have to clean up at the end. And the, the nice thing about chill is that it will automatically do that for you. Again, that's one style. There's never, sometimes you need the more, the, the range act assert. In other cases, the, there's this BDD style can be more useful. Again, options. Uh, what else? Feeding data to tests. Yeah. If you anybody using XUnit? Oh, a couple of people. Are there any non.NET developers here? Sorry about that. 
No, no, I mean that you're in this talk, not that you have to. Um, but uh, there's something reasonably new called, uh, like, uh, like theory is a nice way to call the same test method with different sets of parameters. Uh, in the past, these were all untyped. They were all of type object. Now you have something called theory da data, which takes a generic type parameter that you can use in your test, which makes it a little bit more type safe. It's not, r it's not like it's not going to change the world, but these are the little gems that make it a little bit easier in your test code. And you can see how you use that member data, uh, sorry, member data here, name of, join using writing style, something like that. It's a small thing. It's not that special, but still. Um, another thing is, somebody was saying like, uh, why, do, why don't you never go to, you know, talks about what's new in C Sharp or something. That's, uh, that's actually very nice because I'm using an IDE that teaches me that. It will continuously tell me like, hey, you know what, you can use this new feature to make your code more readable. Uh, Jonas is also very active on that. Sometimes um, we go overboard and something doesn't actually make it more readable, and then you undo that, you know, not everything is great. Everything new is great. Uh, but for example, here you can see examples where we were actually using uh, something like a, a return if the previous char is an ampersand and the statement length is larger than two, and the, the second but last statement item in the array is a, a dollar, and then the but one is an ampersand, and now in the newer C sharp version, you can just say the statement is dot dot comma plus the last two things, which is just a new C sharp feature, which is quite nice actually. It makes the code more readable, but you need to be aware of that, of course. Uh, the same here with uh, what is this? I hear like uh, the method expression is unequal to, uh, it's even too complicated to read, but in the end, it's just saying it should not be an object which method name has a certain value and you have a constant expression. This is something that an IDE like Rider will actually teach you. I guess it's the same thing will happen if you have Visual Studio with ReSharper. Um, but yeah, the idea is that makes your code more readable and we use that everywhere. Um, if you don't use these tools, and again, I'm not paid by JetBrains in any way, but I've seen a lot of code bases where people don't use the tool. Rosalind will, by the way, also help but uh, it will actually teach you the language and try to uh, teach you how to get the most out of the language, which is what we want, of course, and also make it easier to refactor. Here, like, there's an example where we use a special attribute to emphasize that this match rec x, match rec x actually takes a regular expression. And if you do that, then your IDE might actually use that, and when you type a regex, it will provide you with, you know, pop-up information about that regex. makes it easier to read. You can also go to regex101.com, to, to, to test your regex, which I use a lot. Um, but that's, that's a nice feature to do that as well. Um, this is kind of special. Like you have all these new features and newer versions of C Sharp, but they often rely on also specific .NET frameworks. But what if you're still stuck on an older version of .NET, like .NET Framework 4.8 or something like that, and you still want to use newer C Sharp features? It's interesting because some of these features only require you to add a couple of dummy, or not dummy plus, but certain classes to your project in a certain namespace, and then certainly your compiler will understand that. And we've done that in the past. Like, I don't know any real good examples of that but out of the top of my heart. Um, but we've done it in the past, and there's actually a nice library called PolySharp. And when you do that, it will implicitly add generated or provided classes that, will, uh, that basically light up all these new features. And it's smart enough to understand like which version of the .NET framework you're targeting. And then suddenly you can use all these shiny new tools in your old legacy, successful, of course, monolithical database, uh, product, system. Why am I saying database? The other thing, that I w and this is more a design thing, is that I really care about how things depend on each other. And there's a, there's a bunch of rules. And I think it's the book is also it's a book. It's called Principles of Successful Package Management, which is kind of the solid principles, but then on the package level, which we really try to follow in Fluent Assertion as well. And by the way, I use that everywhere. Um, and it's very simple. Every component, package, or boundary um, should only depend, or should only be used uh, by the consumer as a composition thing. I don't like inheritance anymore. It creates a lot of coupling. It's not a bad thing per se, but inheritance tends to actually make things really to couple, and I don't like coupling. Um, the next thing is, you should only depend on a package which is more abstract than you. So if you follow that rule, so if you depend on something that is more abstract, then you're totally fine, or more stable. 
That's another thing. So this is something that really changes the way I build my systems these days. So whenever I have a component, and even if you do a dependency injection, as long as you depend on something that's more stable or more abstract, and things that are abstract are usually more stable, you should be fine. It avoids this whole ripple effect. This is a very simple rule, actually. Also, if you have an optional dependency that not everybody's going to be using, then you use a special package, a dependency package, or component, or whatever you call that. So this dependency package here actually makes sure that this package does not have to depend on this optional dependency. This is the one that does it. And look at, look, look at the, the errors. The dependency pack package actually connects both together instead of the other way around. Also, and there's a couple of other rules. I don't think I have them here. Yeah. Anything that you not always use together here, you should put in a separate package. So if you have, for example, test support, I don't know, you have some library or internal component because you adopt inner sourcing in your company, and that component provides additional capabilities that you do not always need to use when you use the main package. That, for me, is a signal to put it in a separate package because that will help reduce this ripple effect. It will also help that you have to ship a new version of the main package if that auxiliary package is actually changed. It's completely unrelated. So it's almost like the increased cohesion uh, ID and uh, uh, open for extension, sorry to tag that, yeah, closed for, uh, close for, uh, close for modification, open for extensions. It's a very simple rule. Yes, you'll end up with a lot more packages or components, but it'll make your life a lot easier. And finally, no uh, circular dependencies. That should be obvious, right? And the other thing is, is design patterns. Anybody remembers this book? Has ever read it or is it just on your desk? Who, who has read it? Really, honest, come on. It's very old. It's actually pretty good. The problem is that a lot of developers uh, see that as a kind of truth. And of course, people don't read any books anymore. They read on e-paper or they watch a YouTube or Pluralsight training about this. Uh, design patterns are really awesome because they're communication technique. If I tell you I'm using an adapter or it's a singleton or it's a strategy, then hopefully, uh, if you experience enough, you know quite well what that means. And that's the only value of design patterns. So we are, we are using them, obviously, in Fluent Assertion, and I'm using that in my projects. But the guys that wrote this book, they were guys, right? Yeah, they're all guys. Um, actually, uh, 10 years later or something, I heard, told everybody, like, we should have called it refactoring towards design patterns. It's not a goal by itself. Nothing that we do solid is not a goal. It's just a means to an end. So we have been refactoring the code base internally and using the strategies, for example, strategy pattern, to emphasize that this is a particular implementation, that you know what kind of solution to expect. So what about building and uh, testing locally? OK, let's start with something. The first thing I'm using, and uh, maybe if you were in the, the Lightning talk, you've seen it, is Nuke. Nuke is a C-sharp build agent, uh, build, sorry, build library created by Matthias Koch. Maybe he's here, I'm not sure, actually, um, from JetBrains which basically allow you to write your build script in C-sharp, which is nice because uh, I don't like writing in other languages. I used to do a sake, which is PowerShell. Cake is something similar, but it's a half-baked solution. Uh, Nuke is pretty nice. You can, you're going to get like, information like this. It's, it shows you, it's probably not readable at the end, uh, but it shows you all the targets in that script, um, and it can even display a plan. You can see how your whole build process looks like. You can run it locally, and this is an example how it runs, uh, what it looks like. So it's just C-sharp. It's just a nice way. And it means you, you can refactor your build script. You can involve it with your code base. You can run it locally. You run it on your build agent, whether you use Team City or uh, uh, GitHub Actions or Azure Pipelines. The principle is the same. It keeps your YAML to a minimum, really to a minimum, because uh, some of the people that know me know that I do not have a real good relationship with YAML. Um, actually, I hate it. Um, yeah, and, and this completely uh, avoids that. By the way, something similar also exists for cloud deployment. It's called Pulumi, which I use uh, not in Fluent Assertion, but it's a similar idea, which basically keeps you out the YAML hell and the JSON hell of Terraform. You just encode in C Sharp. You can debug it. You can put breakpoints in it. You can refactor things. You know, you can rename things. You can even read it, which is not that unimportant. Um, and it's, it's very extensible. I mean, uh, you, sh you should definitely check it out. I'm using it everywhere. Uh, yes, there's a risk that for me this is the new golden hammer that I'm going to use everywhere, but yeah, we all have something like that. 
Um, what else? Approval tests. Yeah. So a big issue when you build con when you build components or packages or libraries is that there's a contract, and that contract is sometimes implicit. A lot of developers don't realize that, but for me, it's explicit. I really want to make sure that the API um, is completely protected and I don't accidentally break it, especially if it's a bigger code base, uh, it becomes a bit of an issue. So what we use is public API generator, which produces a text file representing the contract of a particular project. And you can specify exactly how it's supposed to use, what it's supposed to export, uh, whether to include internal things, stuff like that. Um, and then we, uh, we actually have a build step in that Nuke thing that you just saw that does that. And then we use Verify, which is another open source project, to compare it. And basically, if somebody accidentally breaks the contract, even ourselves, it will generate a new text file, do the comparison, and tell you, like, it's a unit test, I think, that will verify um, that, that you broke the contract. Sometimes you do it on purpose. And that means you actually will commit that new generated file into source control as part of your pull request, and you can see the change. This is really awesome because we started using everywhere, especially at the, 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 my day job. We're building a lot of extensibility points. Very dangerous to break something. Sometimes developers do not realize, especially with monolithical or no, not monolithical, but spaghetti code bases, you know, that we're all working on every day because nobody's doing, uh, uh, what is it, green, uh, what is it, greenfield projects. It's very useful, very powerful as well. And this is an example of what it looks like. What else? Benchmarking. Yes, of course we do benchmarking. So we use benchmark.net. We don't use it regularly uh, because, yeah, running those on a build agent is not completely reliable. These build agents we, are not, we do not control. We use GitHub Actions for that. But it's an extremely useful thing to identify certain performance bottlenecks. Um, like one of the most complicated features in Fluent Assertions is the ability to compare to object graphs. There's a lot of functionality behind that. Yeah, sometimes we introduce a bug, like somebody saying, hey, we actually have a, we used an array with 1,000 items, and now suddenly the thing, the unit test takes one minute to complete. Yeah, then we have used a profiler. By the way, I didn't mention a profiler. Um, but we use these things then on our local machine to compare, for example, an improvements, like mini, mini benchmarks, which are very useful to do that. Probably you've seen it. I think Scott Hanselman also uh, blogged about it at some point that usually you know, increases the number of downloads for something. We should actually talk about fluent assertions. I'll ask him. He will annoy me. Uh, he will ignore me, as usual. Uh, what else? Yeah, so this is the output. It's completely unreadable, by the way. You have to really study that. But yeah, if you're dealing with performance, you need to study that anyway. Uh, documentation. This is the website. It's nothing more than a Jekyll template. I use minimal mistakes, um, which is something that is built as part of the build pipeline. I can run it locally, so all the documentation is written in Markdown. And there's a nice uh, reason for that, is because if somebody creates a feature, we want the pe that person to also include documentation change that we need for that. Um, um, in, in my internal projects, we do something similar. So we have a lot of reusable components and libraries, and we want to make it very easy for people to use that. So that's how I look at my own library. So we build a documentation site for that. There's lots of different ways. Um, I was being told at this conference there's another one, uh, DocuSaurus or something, that is kind of similar. I need to investigate it as well uh, to make it better. Yeah, and we generate the website. Essentially, when the pull request gets merged to the master branch, then uh, automatically GitHub uh, will pick it up and will refresh the website, which is nice because we don't like writing documentation, but at least if it's coherent, it's consistent with the code changes, makes it a lot easier instead of putting it somewhere on SharePoint where you will never find it back. Oh, this is recorded, huh? Okay. Oh, there goes my MVP status. Um, yeah, this is a Jekyll uh, documentation site. Spell checking, that's a pretty neat thing, of course, because developers make spelling mistakes. We're, we're non-native English speakers, including myself. I'm Dutch. You can hear that. Uh, so we use C-Spell, which is, again, a little neat gem. It's an NPM package, which makes our whole build pipeline a bit more complicated, but it's still part of the build script. And it will basically compare or make sure that all our documentation, including the release notes, do not contain spelling mistakes. Who cares? Uh, it's me. I'm a bit nitpicking sometimes. Uh, actually, we often get pull requests where somebody corrects their spelling mistakes. Well, that saves us some time, of course. Uh, and you see the output. It's an NPM pack, as I said. It uses Node.js or Yarn in this case. Uh, what else? Yeah, review merging pull requests. That's the thing. So 
the biggest problems with pull requests that you receive from the community or pull requests I receive from, a, from my colleagues at my client projects is that sometimes they produce a pull request that we definitely don't want. And it's very hard to say no, especially if you're an open source community. Saying no to somebody who likes your library and wants to contribute to that, but you have the feeling like it doesn't fit there, it's too niche, or it's something that will hurt too much in later on. You have to say no. Similarly, the internal uh, package that we built, uh, that I built at the projects, um, there's always some, some developer that wants a neat feature there. Yeah, you, sometimes you have to say no, but you have to be polite. It doesn't mean like, oh, I'm not going to do it because it's open source or I have to do it on private time. Uh, no, no, sometimes you have to explain that. And that's perfectly okay. It's quite hard. I think there's a lot of, a lot of people wrote about this, uh, this problem of saying no to contributors. Uh, but by the way, I'm not that difficult. I'm Dutch and we're very direct, so we just say no. Uh, usually not, in the, not with just, with a little bit more words. Uh, clean source control history, uh, this is something I really care about. I want in the history of every repository that we're responsible for as an architect, both in Fluentor Services as my projects, I care about being able to go back into the history and understand why something was changed. How often did you go into a code base, you found some code change, you're trying to figure out why was that done? Why did somebody increase the command timeout for a SQL command from 15 to 30 seconds? And then you know, do a blame, and then you find a commit pointing to a pull request in GitHub or Azure DevOps, and the title of that commit is increase the command timeout from 15 to 30 seconds. Right, that's very useful. No, it needs to be a why. Uh, or um, these pull requests or these commits like, oops, I made a mistake or you know, test or review comments or something like that. I really care about that. So I really try to train people how to use interactive rebases, how to use a, a proper Git UI to you know, interactive, to actually group related changes, give it a functional title, ex, you know, the why of the change. I want to know why was that command time increase? Was it some kind of performance issue that you actually solved in the wrong way by hiding it with an increased timeout? That is kind of information that you, should not be, that you will not be able to get back. Having that in the commit is useful because I don't know about you, but I worked on a project for like 12 years at a client and we moved from Team Foundation Server to GitHub to Azure DevOps, God help us, and probably back to GitHub. All of this history is gone. The commits is the only history you have left. So care about that. Put some information in there. It's not that difficult. If you want to know how, I wrote a blog post about it that shows you how you can use all these git save and git undo things that I talked about earlier with a proper UI and build a very nice, it doesn't take you that much time. A couple of minutes will also make your reviewers happy because they don't have to you know, find this one functional change between these other hundred files where you refactor things or move code around. Um, and definitely don't force push the developer uh, to develop. Well, GitHub Actions, I probably don't have to explain that. Everybody uh, that is doing, uh, well, maybe I do, but uh, GitHub Action is basically GitHub's built engine, which technically I think is the same as Azure DevOps these days. Even the build agents are the same. Um, we have a pretty simple YAML script here. Um, it's longer than what you would expect, with, given what I said earlier about Nuke, but that's purely because um, uh, we need to build for multiple uh, .NET frameworks, which makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, yeah, you see the output, nothing special here. But I thought I'd mention this. Code coverage, ooh, that's a sensitive topic. 90%, 95%, 100%. Well, actually, um, I don't even see that. Oh, crap, uh, sorry. Ah, oh, that's what you get when you do test-driven development. And we're completely not obsessed about this. Now, <laughs> the thing is, code coverage is useful, but you have to be very careful that you're not going to be treating it as some kind of goal. And most definitely, don't use the KPI in your management dashboard or something like that. I've seen companies do that. Code coverage is just an indication how well you covered your, your code with tests. You know, whether 90% is, is the lowest value that you want to have, uh, that's up to you. I do think if a code base has something like 35%, then I'm worried. Then there's room for improvement. 80% is probably okay. And we just started, as soon as we started using a coverage tool, because we haven't used that for a while, um, it started to increase structurally. You even found contributors that were also apparently so, um, let's say, um, obsessed or picky 
you know, uh, about this and started to contribute to, uh, pull requests with unit tests that we were missed, that we had missed. If you're in, in an enterprise world, you probably use something like Sonicube, which will do the same thing. It's useful, it has its purpose, but be careful with it. Don't share it with your boss. Unless it's really that great. Then you can ask for a raise, maybe. I don't know. Four eyes review, yeah, that's what we do, because um, as I said, we're with the two of us, mostly. Um, yeah, we just have different views on things. And not in a negative way, but yeah, um, I'm a bit more like, I look usually at the bigger picture, I'm more, I'm more easily satisfied, comes with age, you know, turning 50 almost, you don't care about all the details anymore. No, no, it's just that, yeah, you accept sometimes that your code base cannot be perfect. And fortunately, a Jonas is, uh, can be something a bit more looking at the details, which helps me to be sharp again, that's totally okay. And that will happen in a real project. Or I didn't mention that, by the way, I use emojis in my pull request reviews. Why? To share my frustration and crying, all this, no, no, no. Uh, no, it's cool because I'll share the link later on. Emojis help me express uh, whether a, a comment that I make is really important or not. Sometimes I'm nitpicking and I know it myself. I just make it very explicit. Sometimes it's a seat. I literally use a, the, 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 the symbol, the emoji of a seat to emphasize like, you know what, you don't have to change it right now, but I want you to start thinking about it. Or maybe it's something for myself. Sometimes it's a cross, like you really um, are violating our, I don't know, design guidelines. Sometimes it's a question, like maybe we should talk about it. It's something that I'm not entirely sure this is correct, which helps me, but also helps the contributor or the, the persons, the developers that I work with understand what I mean. Because I had junior developers at my uh, projects that thought that every comment that I make, because I'm the architect, has to be resolved. And that was not my goal. I just want sometimes people to think about it. I mean, it starts with nitpicking, and at some point I'll become pissed off, and then I'll make it across. Now you have to fix it. But it's very useful, by the way. I should have mentioned this. Uh, Auto-merging, which is nice. I think every uh, build engine has that these days, even Azure DevOps, even though it's always behind. So then we have the final phase, which is the releasing. Obviously, we use semantic versioning. If you're not using semantic versioning, uh, it's three numbers, three digits, or not three digits, but three numbers. The first one indicates whether there's a breaking change. The second one means it's non-breaking, there's new features, there might be bug fixes. It's primarily new features. And the last one is there's bug fixes, which creates, it's a communication technique again. If you have a package and you have 1.2.0, and there's a version called 1.3.0, you, you can safely use that. Because what's the biggest issue with a lot of legacy code bases is that they don't update their package anymore. Whether it's NPM or NuGet or something like that. With this, if you know that a package follows the uh, semantic versioning rules, you know what to expect. You know it should be safe, should, no guarantees of course, to upgrade that. From one to two, that's a big thing also means that as a developer of a component or package, you have a certain responsibility. I mean, we are currently at version 6 of Fluent Assertions. Moving to 7 is a big deal. I mean, it's also opportunity. We can get rid of a lot of the bad choices that we made, but it's a big thing. also means we have to support an older version. The same thing, so we accumulate all these potential changes until the next version. So do that also in your internal project, very useful. Git flow or a, a, pr a proper branching strategy is very important. Whether you use Git flow or trunk base or GitHub flow or one variant, use something that's described by the industry and use the same naming standards. Like if I see a repository with a branch called uh, main or master and develop and uh, support and release, then I know it's Git flow and I know what to expect. I know the develop is the one that's currently being developed. I know that the release branch is currently being stabilized. And I know that support represents a, a previous major version of the master branch. Again, communication makes things obvious. You know, the principle of least surprise is part of that. We do that as well, by the way, in Fluent Assertions. We use Git version for that. That's a tool, a .NET tool, that will try to look at the branching strategy, at the tags in your commit history, and generate numbers. You get something like all of this. Uh, Nuke also supports that out of the box, and we use that to number our NuCat packages, to update the build number that you see in your build agent, all this kind of information. It's extremely useful. You don't have to deal with this yourself. There are tools for that. Uh, yeah, this is the example with Nuke. You basically have a read-only property called Git version, and that will be populated uh, with all the information that you need in your build process. Um, releasing, yeah. Very easy. 
you go to GitHub, you say, I want to release something, you fill in a number, and that's it. However, there's some nice features in there that we use heavily, is, for example, automatically generating release notes. Uh, a lot of people still generate, like they use Jira or something like that. It's very easy to generate. In fact, if you use a template, you can tell GitHub that if you put certain labels on the pull request, it will automatically group them in a the correct way. You can say like, okay, this is, a, this is an internal change. This is a new feature. This is a bug change. And your greed release notes will automatically group things. That's very powerful. You don't have to write that yourself anymore. I don't think Azure DevOps has something like that. Maybe it will never get that. That's nice. And it automatically generates like, hey, there's a couple of new contributors to this repository. Um, uh, uh, you can get the full change log. So with all the commits and pull requests in there, it's nice. Also gives credits to people, and you don't have to do anything for that. Comes out of the box. And the final thing is uh, NuGet reserved prefixes, which is not really relevant for internal development, but can be very really relevant for external development. So we basically, uh, were, um, uh, somebody from NuGet reached out to me and saying like, hey, actually, would you want to make it a reserved prefix? Which means nobody else can push a package to NuGet with the fluent assertions prefix. Only I can do that and Jonas can do that. It's a nice little thing. Makes your life a bit easier. People cannot impersonate you or something like that. If a project is small, you don't care. In our case, we do care. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Oh yeah, uh, we're not done. Of course not, every project still has to do things. What else? Well, this whole naming thing that I talked about with the grouping and, and the, the short fact-based unit test, of course the code base is not consistent. It's a real project, just like all the stuff that you guys are building every day. We still have to, f have to clean that up. We also want to get rid of some of these niche features. Um, like, as I said, uh, the, the rules of the principles of package management, we haven't been that uh, consistent on that, so we still have some stuff to decouple uh, and move it into separate packages. Uh, capturing design guidelines. Who's actually capturing design lines in their code base in their projects? Like, nobody? Like a nice page somewhere that describes the rules that you have to follow, or markdown file somewhere, or you're just afraid to sh ah, see, so one person is a, is a professional here. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, we have them as well, but for us, they kind of evolved over the time, and I still have to find time to write something, and I don't like writing. No, that's a lie. Uh, by the way, if you use Fluid Associations, you may know these nice, like you can do 12 December brackets 2022, stuff like that, we want to actually make it a separate package because, yeah, it's an extra feature, shouldn't be in the main package. And it can also be used in production code. Uh, mutation testing, I didn't mention that too extensively. Very powerful technique to find gaps in your code base. We are now running them manually uh, with, what's the name of the library? Uh, Striker. Striker, yes, with a, with a Y. Yeah, we want to make that part of the, maybe at least consider that because they can be quite slow. They're very useful. If you run them on your production database or your production code, I keep saying databases, sorry. I'm, I'm currently in an Oracle project, so that changes everything. Um, but it really will surface all kinds of bugs in your code base, can be very, very valuable. Just like property based testing that was presented today. Uh, dependency management, yeah, I was always looking for ways to make sure that somebody doesn't accidentally create coupling between different components and packages. There's a library called ArcUnit. Um, which I haven't used myself, I only read the documentation, which allows you to create unit tests that verify that certain the namespaces are not used in certain other namespaces. In the long, long time ago, there was something called Endepend, well, it still exists, but I'm not using it anymore, it was too complicated. And this looks like you basically express that dependency or the wish to not have that in C Sharp, which can be useful. That's something I want to look at. Um, maybe good to know, uh, JetBrains is also building their own Sonar Cube which the Sonar guys here at the floor will probably not like. Uh, we're piloting because, yeah, we're good friends with, uh, with JetBrains. It's, I think, I'm not sure if it's even public anymore of yet, uh, but there's something to check it out yourself. Uh, I've used SonarCube a lot. It's very valuable, but the support was sometimes not on par. And uh, as I said, DocuSaurus, I spelled it wrong, but the thing to, to make it easier to build your own website. Because the big problem with Jekyll that I'm using it you're supposed to actually import the Jekyll template as some kind of file so that you can always update it with new features. But yeah, I went, I, I started to change everything. I cannot do anymore. So we would like to see if that's an option to make your internal websites on your, on your, your packages a lot easier. 
Because yeah, you can put your documentation on Confluence and everything else, but ideally you keep it close to your repository. We do that with APIs, we use Open API and Swagger. Why can't we do this with the, the functional documentation on your, your package as well? So, I think that's it. I hope there was something useful for, uh, that you haven't seen before. Uh, I'll be around. You can reach me through all these different channels. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, now's the time, but uh, yeah, maybe totally okay to do it tonight uh, after we have drunk some beer or something like that. Hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, uh, good luck, enjoy the rest of the conference, and happy to see so many people showing up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>